Um, so we have used the keynotes for this uh, event to really open conversations or continue conversations in areas of scholarship and creative, creative activity that are changing in terms of their forms. And so uh, a couple of years ago, we had Debbie Durham, who is director of the Iowa Economic Development Authority, to talk a little bit about the importance of research and discoveries in promoting economic development, um, highlighting how things have changed in terms of how we think of our discoveries, not just as intellectual property, but to move them further into the commercial space. Last year we had Greg uh, Pesco talk to us about the importance of arts and humanities in research of all kinds, um, helping us continue the conversation around convergence and team-based research that really takes a look at problems from multiple perspectives, not only the, the domain or disciplinary areas, but also from the impact uh, on society and people in our environment. So today we are highlighting yet another area, um, but before I talk about that, let me just talk about some things that really aren't changing. We, we're always trying to adapt to our new world, but what is the fundamental aspect of research that we're anchoring ourselves on? And I would say that uh, particularly in the sciences, but this translates into the arts, and human arts as well, the sciences and humanities, the importance of rigor, reproducibility, being able to well articulate your methods and your findings in ways that people can grasp them, and the depth of thought and creativity that goes into our scholarship, that is a constant. There's nothing about that is, that is really changing, and it's the primary vehicle through which our scholarship in any domain uh, gains credibility and rec recognition. So too is the need for uh, transparency, the capacity for scrutiny by various communities of any of our creative or scholarly products. That's a fundamental aspect of what we do when we're doing research and engaging in creative activities. But as we've seen with our past focal areas, um, whether it's leveraging technologies or the ev evolution of team-based uh, research, the practices behind this are changing. And today's topic, which focuses on data sharing, is no exception. So what are the new forms that are coming our way today to ensure rigor, transparency, and scrutiny for various communities? Our capacity to document and share information about our scholarship. Um, and uh, so with research data, we're increasingly called upon by our sponsors to ensure that our uh, data, research data is shared with the various caveats around confidentiality, national security, and proprietary information. But as we try and stand this up across campus through our data sharing task force, we're really grappling with a very challenging problem, and that is that this deeply intersects with research practice. So our, 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 we want to uh, develop more of a conversation across campus on how we do data sharing as researchers. And we have a faculty subgroup that is, is working on this. So this year we've invited Margaret Hedstrom to speak on the challenges of sharing research data um, and really help us begin that, or deepen that conversation across campuses. Um, Margaret has been involved with what today we call digital pres preservation from the very early st stages of understanding um, what we need to do to, to archive electronic records. She was early on involved in activities in state archives in Wisconsin and New York before uh, moving on to her position, her current position at University of Michigan. Um, today she's Robert M. Warner, Colle Collegiate Professor of Information uh, at University of Michigan. She's also a faculty associate of the Inter-University Consortium for Political and Social Research, and this is actually a really fundamental um, uh, place for us as, at Iowa State because this is one of the ways we'll be able to share our uh, social science research data. Um, and she is interim director of the Museum Studies Program, which sounds like it might be um, tangential, but actually when you start talking to Margaret, it's not at all. It's more, uh, more about uh, preserving history and, and uh, being able to share that with others. Uh, Margaret's also been active in national conversations, for example, through the uh, National Research Council's Committee on Digital Curation, Workforce, and Education. 
Um, she has a long-standing interest in history. In fact, her, her next job is to move back to history um, and uh, has had persistent interest in digital curation and archiving, as I indicated earlier. Um, in this capacity, she has led a couple of really interesting NSF-funded projects. Number one, she had a, a very early, 10 years ago, a, a graduate training program that she led around data sharing where they were looking at different disciplinary practices and, and um, how that affected data sharing. And then she's also led the uh, SEAD uh, SEED um, project, which is a collaboration between researchers between uh, Michigan, Indiana, and Illinois universities that has really been developing some infrastructure around uh, managing, preserving data, and providing tools for access. So I'm very excited to have Margaret uh, Hedstrom join us today. Please join me in welcoming Margaret um, up here on the podium. Steal your water. Oh, don't do that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Sarah, for that introduction. And um, thanks to all of you who have made this trip work um, and all of the arrangements. And uh, thanks to all of you for coming out today. I'm hoping to start a conversation and raise some concerns and issues that I've had uh, through my experience working with a variety of scientific communities and disciplines across the social, physical, uh, biomedical, uh, and humanities communities. Um, I, I want to start by kind of grounding us a little bit on where we are and why we are where we are with regard to data sharing and uh, requirements for sharing data. So I think the ideals of public access to information are a driving force that are kind of indisputably core values that we share, that fundamental to democratic societies is having a means to hold governments accountable for their actions and their decisions. Um, having access to information is critical for an, an informed citizenry, for uh, an educated public. Um, there's also the notion that being able to get access to data, research, science, and other kinds of information is a catalyst to creativity and innovation. And um, that given that the public has in invests in the infrastructure and the funding for research and science, there ought to be a return to them for uh, that investment. A lot of what we um, are facing with sharing data comes out of the framework of the Freedom of Information Act, which set the initial uh, requirements and processes for access to government information. And I won't um, go into this in detail, but I think it's fair to say that some of the challenges we face with data sharing and making data accessible to the public are Part are in, due in part to the fact that, in a way, the data sharing mandates are sort of an extension of and embedded in the Freedom of Inf Information Act. Where what's important here is that, from a public citizen perspective, the burden of finding the information, requesting it, and obtaining it rests on the person doing, making the request. And while any person 
You don't have to be a citizen. You can be a non-citizen. You can make a FOIA request to a government agency. Um, you, uh, there are a lot of constraints on what information might be provided to you. So I won't go into it in detail, but um, there are nine important exemptions. Classified information, internal information to agencies, information pro prohibited by another federal law, uh, trade secrets, commercial and financial information, and you know this is a this is a, a, a major uh, challenge for people, for example, in the environmental field trying to get physical and chemical data uh, through from regulatory agencies that is classified as you know commercial proprietary secret um, privileged information between communications between agencies um, the in, any information that would be uh, in, potentially invade in a person's privacy, uh, information compiled for law enforcement, uh, information that concerns supervision of financial institutions, and then some lobbying organization got in there and got geological information on wells. So not quite sure why that rose to being one of the nine, but it is. And the basic process is Implementation, you make your request, you wait, and then you pay. And uh, while there are exemptions for people to, uh, who are indigent to have the fees waived, basically the agency does not go out and do searches for you, pull data out of databases, the, um, the basic premise is that you ask for a record, and if the agency has it and it is not exempt, then you can get it, and it, you, know, you get the first 100 pages and two hours of search time for free. I don't know what 100 pages of an extract from a database is, but, um, and then after that, you kind of wait and see how much it's going to cost. So this is not a simple process, even for very um, practiced people who work on um, FOIA requests. For your average citizen, it's rather overwhelming. Um, and it's very narrow in what it covers. It, because it excludes all classified data, commercial data, personal information, geological information on wells, and information otherwise pro pro uh, prohibited by, for, from disclosure by some other federal law. Now, the point of all this is that what we have in place with regard to data is started as an extension to the, the FOIA Act. And in 1999, uh, Senator Richard Shelby introduced an amendment that would extend FOIA to require all federal awarding agencies to ensure that all data produced under an award will be made available to the public under FOIA. Now, what do you think the response to that was from the scientific community? I will say not very positive. And there was quite an outcry about um, publication, pre-publication, um, being, being required to um, allow anybody to get access to your data. Uh, and so there was a final OMB rule that very much limited the scope of this. 
to recorded materials, uh, and it exempted preliminary analyses, trade secrets, copyrighted and patented materials, and drafts of scientific papers. Um, the implementation started first, I said, I put NEH, but I mean NIH, the National Institutes for Health, um, which started with a policy in 2003 that required projects that had $500,000 or more per year in direct costs to file a data management plan and explained how how you would share data, or if you were not going to share your data, um, explain why that was not possible. Um, and that then led to data sharing requirements being introduced by the National Science Foundation in 2011. And finally, in 2012, the Holdren Memo, which extended this requirement to all federal funders. So um, the, the, I think, in my own view, the idea of opening up federally funded, and both federal government data and federally funded data to public access was a well-intentioned um, effort to accomplish quite a number of things. And, um, and I think there were very high hopes of a rapid transformation in the infrastructure of scholarly communications, in the infrastructure for sharing data, in the practices of scientists, which were well documented as being conservative and proprietary with regard to their data, even though the, the uh, federal government had funded them. Um, and the notions about getting data out there, and this kind of went along with, you know, the fourth wave in scientific discovery, that, that if we had pools of data that we could um, attack from a lot of different angles with new tools, um, we would have this much more rapid discovery cycle. Um, that having data open and shareable would um, lower the cost of scientific research because if you could reuse or borrow someone else's data, you wouldn't have to go out and collect similar data again. Um, that this process would enhance public trust in science and scientific expertise because, you, you know, people who had an interest would be able to go back and validate and verify um, the results of science and the processes behind it. Um, that it would lower the barriers to engaging in science, and in particular, could potentially spur a large citizen science movement, um, and also have data available to attract younger people into scientific fields, um, to certainly to recapture the public benefit from publicly funded research and to um, hold researchers and funding agencies accountable for how they're spending their research dollars and to some degree for the quality of their results. So I'm going to take a little poll now and you can do, I'll make it simple, binary, thumbs up or thumbs down on how are we doing? So enabling new discoveries through reuse of existing data. I don't have my glasses on, so <laughs> I'll have to put my glasses on for this. Okay. 
Um, lowering the cost of scientific research. Okay, that's pretty unanimity on that one. Um, enhancing public trust in science and scientific expertise. Okay, a little disagreement, but lowering the barriers and creating more opportunities to engage in science. And recapturing the public benefit from publicly funded research. So, so. Okay. Um, my, my point in gauging all this is not to suggest that the goal is wrong, but to really look at why is this such a hard thing to do? Um, and what are some of the problems and pitfalls that we have encountered in the process of trying to both implement the requirements of data sharing and integrate more sharing of data into our own practice. So, whoops, I skip over that one. So, um, you know, it turns out that sharing data is not easy. Um, finding, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of these things, but finding and gaining access to it is difficult. I don't know if anyone has tried to, for example, file a FOIA request to get government data from a federal agency. Has anyone tried that? Were you successful? <laughs> yes, okay. Um, and was it a, a pleasant and easy experience? <laughs> <laughs> And when you got the data, was it useful? Okay, okay, we got one success story here. Um, but, you know, uh, it, for mo most of the rest of you, you haven't taken that route. Um, and that's perfectly understandable because it's hard to figure out where to even look for data that you might want to reuse. Reusing data is difficult. It's not like picking up a scholarly article and reading it and thinking about the analysis and the findings. You're picking up this rather non-self-describing set of stuff and you know, trying to figure out what can I make of this. Um, the other, some other pitfalls, I think, that we really need to pay attention to are um, the high risk of disclosing personally identifiable data, the high risks of misinterpretation and erroneous results, um, especially when data are reused by people outside of the discipline in which it originated, um, and that when the public is reusing scientific data, they are not subject to the norms, the review, and the quality standards that we as scholars and researchers are subject to. You know, as part of our disciplines, as part of our ethical responsibilities to science and to our institutions, so um, I just will say a little tiny bit, I'll try to be brief here about the, you know, finding data. Data, you know, come in many flavors and shapes and smells and sizes and colors. And they, um, it, they, they are held in, very dispersed places. And I think this is part of what the data sharing uh, requirements we're trying to get at, which is, you know, you're, if you're keeping your data on your personal hard drive or your project servers, you're hoarding it or you're making it difficult to discover. Um, 
Their data are held in campus storage and compute facilities. People are using commercial services, cloud services, but also very specialized commercial services to store their data. There are many domain and specialized repositories for data. There are publishers who've stepped up to the plate and said, we'll take the data, our da your data with your publication. And in some places, we demand your data or we won't publish your paper. There are institutional repositories and an increasing number of private data aggregators and, and data brokers, as well as federal, state, and, and local agencies that have lots of, um, that have uh, uh, lots of data. Now, if you think that finding data is hard, because knowing where to start if you think that, I'm sorry, if you think that finding data is hard for us, we have some experience with it, think about the, a member of the public who's trying to find data. But the challenges are knowing where to start looking. And then for um, many people outside, certainly of uh, academia, you run into paywalls, or you run into repositories that are restricted to members only. Um, so we, we have a long way to go to begin to achieve these ideals of, um, of open access and, and open science, especially with regard to the public. Now, um, Using, reusing someone else's data is also difficult. So one can discover data sets in repositories. They could be well described. They could have lots of good metadata with them. But, un, but, but they aren't self-explanatory and in order to actually assess whether somebody else's data set is going to be relevant and of sufficient quality and manipulable in the right way, you almost have to consume the data set <laughs> before you can figure out whether it's going to work for you or not. It's not like being able to go through and read a lot of abstracts for uh, scholarly papers and then decide whether um, of this one looks relevant, it's been cited by a number of people, um, and it, is that my phone? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the worst mistake to make. <laughs> anyway. Um, you know, you can't. You have to uh, actually really dig in to the data. So if you're going and looking for data and thinking, well, I could use this, I could use this, I could use this, I have to invest in um, a lot of um, manipulating it, testing it, trying it out before I can even make a decision about whether it's going to be useful or not. Um, typically, analysis requires some kind of infrastructure. It may require uh, computing power. It may require you know, instrumentation. It may require any number of things um, that is not readily available to anyone. Um, and I think we've learned from a growing effort at reanalysis that um, being, a being able to do replication of results really depends on having a lot of information about the original context, where the data came from, how they were collected, how they were cleaned, 
what kind of analytical tools were used and the like. And then trying to repurpose data for a topic different from what it was originally intended for is even more challenging because you need to understand what were the original assumptions behind the data collection? What were the processes? What were the, what were the standards of the original um, data producer for quality or for validity of data? So, um, and then, you know, it is the case that even high quality data that yields, um, you know, very valid results can still be misinterpreted and, and misused. So I just will say a little bit about disclosure risk, and then I want to move on to, uh, on a more positive note, some um, things that I think we can do about this. Um, so in the area of disclosure of personal identity, in particular, um, the, the methods developed for de-identification, anonymization uh, of personal data are increasingly challenged by the wide availability of data on the web, on, through brokers and aggregators, through publicly accessible directories, through any number of um, social sensors that allow re-identification of subjects. And, and so this is an area where even our best attempts at de-identification can be broken and increasingly individuals can be um, identified. Um, there are another risk is that um, private entities are not held to the same legal or ethical standards with regard to releasing personal data. And you might point, for example, to um, the social media platforms. Those are, the, the, the data that are there are there at the consent of the account holder, but the account holder may not have thought through all of the ways in which somebody else could use that data for something other than um, communicating with your friends or your trusted group or the rest of the world. Um, peer review scholarly work, and we have many cases uh, with, where the work is misinterpreted and even weaponized by detractors. So in particular, climate deniers and conspiracy theorists. And you know, I, it concerns me that in a in a world where, rather than the trust in science increasing, it seems to be um, coming more polarized. That um, being able to counter some of the malicious uses of science, I would say, uh, is, it, it's, I think it's a real challenge for us. And um, there are even examples where citizen science projects um, can undermine uh, sound scientific findings. So in the Flint water crisis, citizen science was a critical piece of, um, of discovering the high lead levels in water in the, in the uh, initial round of, uh, of um, exposing the problem. But 
after the water was switched back to the Detroit water system and trained scientists and monitored, observed citizen scientists confirmed that the water was okay to drink, there, were, there was a counter group of citizen scientists claiming that um, it wasn't safe to drink, that it wasn't safe to bathe or shower in the water. And that eventually led to an outbreak of some skin disease, not caused by showering the water, but caused by poor hygiene. So, you know, it, it, these... The, the damages from misuse are, are real. Um, so I want to just now start some um, sort of food for thought, maybe for our conversations as we, we um, go through the day. Um, and... I think part of the, one of the challenges is that the current data sharing mandates aim to establish open access to all data as the norm. And we might want to rethink that. So we might want to think about setting priorities, and changing the default condition in, an, in a few ways. So rather than talking about you must share your data because somebody might want to use it, what if we flipped it and said, we want to encourage borrowing data. We actually want to encourage scientists to work with their peers and colleagues where they have potentially useful data and um, borrow that data for a purpose that's driven by science and a scientific problem. What if we used demand to drive our priorities? Um, one thing that I, you know, I've observed over many years with regard to data that has been well archived and put out for reuse, especially in the um, social science data world, is that you know the use follows a power law, and a small number of all these data sets get the vast majority of use. It's not clear that make, making data, the, that the investments in making all data accessible and shareable is the best way just to distribute the limited amount of funding and effort and time and attention that we have for this problem. Um, what if we opened data incrementally, and by incrementally, I mean incrementally to larger groups of people, starting with immediate collaborators, and then peers, and then others in one's discipline, and then to communities, and in the process, correct, amplify, curate, uh, and validate the data before we open it to the public. And by and I and I I'm not saying. No, under no conditions could any member of the public ever, you know, request this data. But um, the the 
the ways in which we learn from each other about how hard it is to use somebody else's data, even if they're sitting down the hall from you, I think provide important lessons for what do we need, you know, where do we make investments in curation, in metadata, in standards, and the like. And then um, we, we, we have so, such limited we have such limited um, time and energy and resource and knowledge about this that couldn't we w better target these limited resources on improving the quality and the usability and the accessibility of data that's known to be of value or known to be in demand? Um, and um, I guess my, I, my, my part of my thinking about this for us as researchers and scholars is data sharing begins at home. And um, you know, I have some thoughts about things we can do as researchers and scholars. And um, you know, let the science drive the data so that you collect and produce good data so that you can do good science. Um, and I, I think thinking about quality, and by that I mean quality of output and scholarly accomplishments and all of that, as much or more than quantities of publications and data sets and smallest publishable units um, that, I, I, I mean, I guess I'm old enough to say, I think we should slow down a little bit and put some emphasis on, on quality here. Um, and start by developing and reinforcing the local norms, the norms of your lab, the norms of your students uh, that you want to transfer to your students, the norms of your discipline. Um, and worry later about everybody else who might possibly want to use your data. I think as an experiment, one can learn a lot by practicing by trying to use somebody else's research data. This is a, can be an incredibly eye-opening um, uh, opportunity to see how much tacit knowledge one has about their data that is very difficult to express as metadata or documentation. And um, thinking about ways in which that tacit knowledge can be transferred or captured uh, in a way that's more effective but also easier than thinking about adding more metadata to all the data in, that you have. Um, and focus on the value, the integrity, and the usability of data for your own research. Because if you don't pass that barrier, then you're never going to pass the barrier of it being useful to someone else. Um, I, a couple more things. I think as teachers and mentors, we need to model good practices. And I really feel very strongly that there are deep ethical issues, in particular around pr personal privacy protection, quality of research um, results, and transparency in, in the process. Um, and then as institutions, um, where do we set our priorities for investment? And by institutions, I mean universities, funders, both separately and together. 
Um, and, you know, I really think turning supply on its head and thinking about demand might be a useful way to consider where to start. Um, because we know a lot about the supply of data. There's lots of it. It's messy. It's hard to find. It's uh, stored all over the place. It could be useful, but it might not be. So why don't we start saying, you know, which data, which kinds of an an analytical tools, what kind of instruments, what methods are most in demand from scientists? Where are the hurdles? Where are the roadblocks that access to data are going to help you overcome? Um, or conversely, which research questions might you be able to answer or which problems might you be able to solve if you had access to more or different or higher quality data? Um, and then I think thinking about where can you make small investments in improving data quality um, that would yield, could yield large results. Um, and I think seeking common solutions and developing shared infrastructure and services is great but we ought to recognize there isn't, you know, a single problem here. So where is the lowest common denominator of data management problems that really require a common approach? And where are those problems still deeply embedded in the discipline and the science? Um, I think we tend to have these um, kind of one-size-fits-all solutions. Let's build a data repository, bring your box, your standard box of data in, and add some metadata. There's data in here, and it's tied up with a string. Um, is you know, it's 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 uh, in, in my view, not embedded enough in the scientific practice. So I'm just going to um, leave some final thoughts and food for thought, I hope. Um, we need to learn about the demand side. What data do scientists demand access to? We ought to think about borrowing data as opposed to sharing data. And I think that that helps to make more of a match between um, the demand and the supply and who, is, who has the data to share and who really wants to borrow it. Um, I want to reinforce the idea that good data and data sharing is not an end in itself. Good science makes good data, and focusing on the good science and the rigor there, um, I think, can go a long way toward addressing some of the challenges that we face. Um, less is more and better. All data are not created equal. They aren't all equally valuable. I'm sorry, but they don't all deserve uh, care and tending at the same level. And, and we don't have the resources to sort of spread over any data that anybody might possibly envision ever possibly using in some future. We got to start with what we know is valuable and important. And then um, I guess I would say start sharing with your neighbor and then your neighborhood and then your community and then with the rest of the world. And I think 
you know, we will have a better result uh, that way. So thank you. Hello. This this works. So, um, all right. Thank you very much, Margaret. Um, actually, I think that your comments are really reflective of some of the the issues that we're grappling with in our data sharing task force. Are there questions from the audience for Margaret? Comments? And I will just uh, pitch something out there. I I think that um, the agencies have really punted on how to evaluate value. So while we are establishing infrastructures to share so that we can meet these mandates, mm -hmm. um, they, I think they recognize that we can't do everything. And they, they have sort of punted towards the disciplinary societies mm -hmm. um, to think that through. And when I think about, so we think a little bit about models of sharing on campus, so people in astronomy and math and genomics and so on. Are, um, have these practices and actually place a lot of emphasis uh, that's similar to what you've mentioned here. Um, what, what, how do we move to the demand side? Is this a disciplinary question? Um, how does an individual researcher, let alone an institution, mm -hmm. understand that? Well, First of all, I think there's a need for research from that, that's kind of macro level research on who is using data that is already available and has been deposited in repositories. Um, I have started a study with a PhD student at the School of Information where we are looking at the data citation index, which has 5.4 million citations to data sets acquired from repositories around the world. And of those 5.4 million data sets, there's only 100 that have two or more citations. What that means is, and so then we've gone in and tried to understand what are the characteristics of those. And they tend to be long-standing studies that have been validated, some continually, you know, updated incrementally. They have been they are data sets that are the results of projects to actually make a large reusable reference data set. And I think, you know, in the genomics field, there are a number of, of these kinds of data sets, and some of them are on the list. But what one has to consider is that the other, you know, um, 5.3999999 million data sets out there, either their time hasn't come yet, or they're about something that some, someone um, hasn't considered, uh, or they're hard to find. So, you know, there are a number of possibilities. But it's also possible that they're little nichey things and they're um, not very reusable and they're not well documented. But somebody invested time and effort in getting these into a repository, in storing them, in making them available. So um, I think we have to get our heads around the the. The, the demand side that way, like, and and the characteristics um, need to be extracted at, at a fairly, I think, high level of abstraction. Now, I think within the disciplines, priorities, research agendas, you know, those kinds of things are important. 
And then there are, um, I don't know if NSF is still sponsoring these, but they used to do, and I think some of the other funding agencies, you know, these grand challenge um, calls. And they'll do wor a workshop or symposiums or whatever, and it'll be grand challenges in, uh, let's say, sustainability science. And coupling... Uh, data component to those kinds of things. Like, how could we, what data could we reuse? Or what data do we not have? Or what data is difficult to get? Or we have to purchase it? Or, you know, we get it, but we can't use it because of X, Y, or Z. I mean, I think that's a, you know, there's, this problem-focused approach may, may also work. Thank you, Margaret, for your talk. I, I learned a lot, and I have to say that uh, open data expectations aren't quite one of the things that keep me up as a scientist, but are close. Uh, mm -hmm. So I really appreciated your, your comments here. I'm curious about the borrow, don't share, if you could talk a little bit more about that and whether there are examples out there of how to do that well. Um, I'm in, in, in raising that, it's really more a metaphor for um, getting a handle around the demand side. So who wants to borrow your data? And we do know from the research about data sharing that a lot of the demand comes informally to particular scientists or particular labs um, and they, you might say, they're saying, would you share your data with us? But they're reflecting a demand, if you think of it as, these people want to borrow our data, right? And so, I mean, I think, and, and, and collecting more of the informal experience with who's asking for what is another way to sort of think about priorities. I have one more. Um, can you flip back to uh, the slide of what should we do as researchers? Mm -hmm. Uh, that one, yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, so I, this is uh, actually the thing that keeps me up at, at night is really around data quality and when we mm -hmm. post things, um, it's just like putting a publication out there. If someone finds an error, um, you know, you're on the hook to correct it and get it um, taken care of with data. There's much more granular information. Mm -hmm. And it strikes me that what you've put up here is actually what, uh, we have some labs on campus that they pre-register their studies so their mm -hmm. hypotheses are out in the open. Mm -hmm. um, they have open lab notebooks mm -hmm. so that there's sort of this community self-correcting going mm -hmm. on along, uh, along the way. I just wonder if um, what you see coming down the road in terms of either tools or culture that help us enable it, that, that kind of practice. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm going to punt on this one a bit because I do think that it is somewhat discipline specific, but registering experiments, registering hypotheses, open lab notebooks, and figuring out how in particular to take the lab notebooks and rapidly transform them into the documentation one needs in order to reuse data um, has a lot of promise. So I'm for all those things, but I don't know how well they work <laughs> for you as scientists um, doing, you know, doing your work and trying to better document and, and share it. I think the people I've talked to, it, it sort of, it can slow you down because you're being more deliberate as you go through the process, but perhaps you're more effective because you're always really staying focused on, on quality. So, 
I think that we are at time, so I want to thank everybody for coming, and um, let's take a moment to thank Margaret for her inspiring talk. Thank you. Thank you very much.